In Leviticus chapter 5, for example, the Bible says, if you touch anything that's unclean, you become unclean whether you know it or not. Leviticus chapter 5. This is why the Jews were always afraid to touch things or taste things or handle things. You sit down on a pew if a menstruous woman, forgive me if this is inappropriate, if a menstruous woman had touched that pew and you didn't know it, you still became unclean. If somebody had touched a dead body and they opened the door and you opened the door, you become unclean whether you know it or not. If you inadvertently stepped on a snail, according to Leviticus 11, that was an unclean creature, you became unclean whether you knew it or not. So let's say by law, you say, now I'm going to be saved by law. I'm going to fumigate the room. I'm going to stand at attention. I'm going to read the law of God 24 hours. I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to focus my mental energies on God and things pure. I don't think you can do that. But let's say for the sake of illustration, you can. 24 hours later, you're so proud of yourself. You've kept your mind on God. You haven't touched any unclean thing. You haven't eaten anything. And you think, I'm saved by my, my own works. And the Lord said, no, you're guilty. Guilty? What did I do wrong? See, you didn't do anything wrong. The priest did. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 3. The anointed priest can sin in such a way that he brings guilt upon the people. Remember, David sinned and thousands died in a place called David's sin. You say, nobody can be saved that way. You say, that's the point. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now there was one day in the year when the Hebrew people felt better than at any other time and that was on the Day of Atonement. In Leviticus chapter 16, we find the duties of the high priest. The day before, you might not know whether you're saved. The day after, you might not know whether you're saved. But on that day, oh, oh, oh I'm saved, the priest bathed. He dressed in holy garments. He offered at the door of the tabernacle a bullock for a sin offering. He presented at the same place two goats for a sin offering. He cast lots over the goats, one to be sacrificed, the other to be let go in the wilderness. He sacrificed the bullock. He passed from the court through the holy place to the holy of holies with a censer and incense. He filled the space with the smoke, of, with a cloud of the smoke. He returned to the court for the blood of the bullock and passed again through the veil to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. He returned to the court and killed the goat upon whom the lot had fallen for sacrifice. For the third time he returned to the holy of holies and did the same with the goat's blood as he had done with that of the bullock. He purified the outer part of the tabernacle by sprinkling blood and placed some on the horns of the altar. He returned to the court and placed the blood of the bullock and the goat upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and sprinkled it there seven times. He offered to God the remaining goat, laying his hands upon it and confessing before it the sins of the people. He consigned the goat to a man, take it to the border of the wilderness and release it. He bathed and changed his linen garments for his regular priest clothing. He sacrificed two rams as burnt offerings for himself and for the people. He burnt the fat of the sin offering upon the altar. He saw to it that the remainder of the sin offering would be burnt without the camp. He had a busy day, but on that day the people said, I don't know about tomorrow. I I don't know about, but right now I'm saved. I'm forgiven because our high priest is ministering before us right now. Question, where is our high priest? Where is he? He is not in figures of the true, not in a little earthly tabernacle or temple. <laughs> He's at the real thing. He's right in the presence of God. And what is he doing there? He is ministering in our behalf. He doesn't die. Aaron died. Every high priest died. Their death, their mortality prevented them from a ministry of a continuing ministry. Now Jesus died just once, but he ever liveth to make intercession for us. You shouldn't sin. We ought not to sin. But if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. So the mediator of the new covenant comes into your heart at the time you confess him as Lord. He knocks at the door. I want to come in. Roman, uh, John 14, 23, the word monet only found two times in the Bible. Translated mansions in John 14, 2. 
In my Father's house are many mansions. John 14, 23, King James Version translated as abode. abode. Same, same Greek word, two different English words to translate it. So he said, my father and I are going to come, we're going to make our abode. And just as in the physical sense, you know, 1 John 5, 11 and 12, this is eternal life, that whoever has the Son has life, whoever doesn't have the Son doesn't have any life. So if you have the life, if you've invited Jesus Christ into your heart, just as in your physical development inside the mother's womb, you learn to crawl, walk, ride a bicycle, drive a car, use a computer, this development, the, the writing is there, but the development involves associating with, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You don't bear fruit unless you attach to the vine. Jesus is life. If you have him, you have life. If you don't have him, you don't have any life. And the thing that Jesus is doing as the mediator of the new covenant, he's constantly working. He's every day. He said, I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. Come to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. I'll give you a take my yoke and learn from me. I'm going to be constantly teaching you every moment. I number the hairs of your head. I watch the sparrow. I'm busy. My father worketh hitherto and I work. I don't know very many Hebrew words, but I do know the Hebrew word for glory. It's kabod. And it is literally, it literally means heavy. Uh, Absalom cut his hair every year, waited, it was kabod. Heavy. Eli, 98 years old, sitting on a rock. His sons Hophni and Phinehas had just been killed in battle. And when he heard that the ark of God had been stolen and that his two sons were dead, he fell backwards and broke his neck because he was kabod. He was heavy. Well, when the glory of God descended on the tabernacle, there was no way to explain that to somebody who wasn't there. And so much as the hippies did a generation ago, they said, it's heavy. What was it like? I don't can't, can't tell you. Oh, it's Shekinah glory. Fire came down. Oh, it was profound. It was weighty. It was heavy. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we have again the distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, you, you yourselves are our letter written, you know, there you go, that God put his DNA in you at the time of your conversion. And you're developing, working out our own salvation with friend. We're growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't re remain a microscopic embryo. We're in the process of developing using the spiritual gifts that God has given us. You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. And then notice how many times the word glory occurs in this context. Now, if the ministry that brought death engraven in letters of stone came with glory, and it did. <laughs> how much more the glory that's going to come with the new covenant? If the old covenant had glory, what about the new? Verse 8, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious... How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious had no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory that lasts? And then in the last verse of chapter 3, 2 Corinthians 3.18, the Bible says that he, we 